Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Altium Academy. I'm Zach Peterson, I'm a technical consultant with Altium, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about how to use two-layer boards, specifically when you wanna use them to route digital signals, and even when you can route some high-speed signals. Two-layer boards are generally seen as a hobbyist's friend, and I talk to a lot of hobbyists, they all say, yeah, you know, we work with two-layer boards all the time. I've even done some professional designs for clients on two-layer boards. These are generally designs that don't use a lot of high-speed or digital or anything like that, they're like DC. They're doing something simple with it. When is it appropriate to use a two-layer board for high speed and how exactly do you do it? That's what we're gonna look at in this video. Let's go ahead and get started. With two-layer boards, one of the questions that sometimes comes up, can you use them for digital and specifically, can you use them for high-speed digital? So that's a fair question, because if you look at some popular microcontroller boards that use an interface like USB or Ethernet, you will actually see that they are done on two-layer boards. So, what's the problem with doing everything on a two-layer board? Technically, you can route some of the slower end of the high-speed digital interfaces on a two-layer board if you route them correctly. Generally with something like I2C or SPI, as long as you have a large enough bus capacitance or a large enough uh, pull-up resistor, especially on the I2C line, then you're not so worried about it so much. Those interfaces are kind of hard to break. However, they can experience crosstalk just like any other digital protocol. So that's the kind of stuff that you want to keep in mind. When you're working with the two-layer board, if you route a bunch of high-speed stuff on a two-layer board, it's gonna be difficult to hit impedance targets. Also, you probably have some EMI problems, especially if you don't use a ground plane. So this is all of the kind of stuff that you have to consider when you're doing a two-layer board. So the first thing we wanna look at is, of course, impedance. If you wanna do anything with digital at high speeds, you may have to worry about impedance. So what's the problem with that? Well, first, here's my side view of a PCB, and we're just gonna make it a two layer PCB and I've got my signal up here. You might be asking, what should be down here? Should this be signal? Should it be ground? Should it be a mix of both? Well, if you need controlled impedance, then you should be routing over ground. This can create some difficulties with what's happening on the top layer. What happens on the top layer? Well, you need to have some access to ground and that's one of the reasons why you would definitely want to have a ground plane here because wherever you have components, if you have them all on one layer, then you've got really easy access to ground, right? You can just put a via here, okay? Same thing with this guy. Let's say this component needs to have access to ground, throw a via right here. Ground planes are definitely a must in a two layer design, mostly because you need to get access to ground somewhere it's really easy to do it if you just have a ground plane. Ground plane is gonna provide some shielding and it's gonna set a limit on the uh, cross-sectional uh, inductance of any traces on the board and it's gonna help keep crosstalk down. It's not going to eliminate it, but it's going to help keep it down. If we look at this board, and let's say we wanna route a trace on this board that's going to be running at high speed, okay? So I have my board and I have my trace. Let's just say this is my section of trace. This is my SIG. Let's say that this is carrying a high-speed signal. Remember, with high-speed signaling standards, you generally have an impedance target, Z sub zero. And if you remember all of our discussions on characteristic impedance, then you know that Z sub zero is defined as L over C square root when there are no losses present. In general, there will be losses present, so it's not exactly this, but this is a good example. This will help us you know, understand why exactly two layer boards are not necessarily suitable for cases where you need to have impedance control, and we'll look at why here. This distance between my signal and my ground plane, D, that's going to determine both the capacitance per unit length and the inductance per unit length. What happens when I have a really big value for D? Like when D is, uh, let's say, 62 mils. So this is your standard PCB thickness. So we have a very small value for C compared to the case of a four layer board, where if we have like a four layer board, D might be something more along the lines of like seven mils. Okay, so what's the problem here with having D really large? and trying to hit this impedance target here. Let's say we wanna hit like 50 ohms. If C is very small, we then need to make L very small. 
in order to hit a 50 ohm impedance. Well, how do we do that on a PCB? Well, we have to make the traces much wider. So in order to do that with a two layer board, if this distance is, let's say 62 mils, up on the top layer, if we're dealing with, you know, FR4 that has a DK of about, let's say, you know, 4.2, so maybe a high speed laminate, the problem is that your width W is gonna be somewhere on the order of like 110 mils. That's pretty big, okay? That's gonna be a lot bigger than the pitch on most pins. So you'd have to route with 110 mil traces for single-ended high-speed signals in order to hit your target impedance of 50 ohms. So that's one of the challenges with routing high-speed signals on a two-layer board. It's really hard to hit your impedance targets without making really big fat traces. You have to use smaller traces, number one, but then you have to accept that there might be some impedance mismatch between your trace and some other component on the board. So how do you deal with that? So we have to go back to the concept of input impedance. And input impedance is normally used to describe analog signals, but in this explanation, it applies equally well for digital. So if you go back to the discussion on input impedance, if the trace length is short enough, it's gonna seem like for your components that the trace doesn't even exist. In this case, when we have our four layer, or sorry, our two layer board, you know, if I have a component over here and I wanna drive another component that is over here, normally with a high speed interface, you might have you know, Z sub zero requirement of 50 ohms. This might expect a Z sub zero of 50 ohms. And what if this is something like, you know, 75 ohms? Well, if this trace is short enough, this component is only going to see the impedance at the input of this component. So now the challenge becomes being able to route your high speed digital on your two layer board, but only when the traces are short enough. Now, this is where you're actually limited in the number of interfaces that you can select because most interfaces, if you actually start to calculate the trace length that you need in order to provide some separation between components, it's actually gonna be really short and it's not really gonna be useful on a two layer board, but there are some interfaces that you can use. So what's one example? First example is USB 2. USB 2.0 can be done on a two layer board as long as the traces are short enough. If you look at an Arduino, like an Arduino uh, Uno, that's a great example of one board where USB is used. You will actually see that there is a microcontroller that uses USB on that board and it places the USB uh, transceiver very close to the connector in order to provide the controlled impedance connection over to the connector and then that is an impedance match to the cable. So I said before that we need to look at the input impedance to determine exactly how short this trace length should be. The problem is that input impedance operates in the frequency domain and so you'd have to pick a really high frequency to determine when this trace length is short enough that you can essentially just ignore it in this link that you're designing. What you can do is you can use the rise time. The rise time is one of the things that determines how a signal behaves when it is a high speed signal or when it's a digital signal, how it interacts with other components or other traces on the board. And so you can use the rise time to figure out an approximate, not, not the exact, but the approximate limiting length that you should keep your trace length below in order to ensure that you can get a signal from this component to this component over a high speed interface without worrying about the impedance mismatch. So what should that limit be? Well, this is where you need the propagation velocity and then you need the rise time of the signal. We've discussed this a little bit in other videos and so I'll review it here because it's, import, it's an important exercise to go through when you're trying to design this trace length to have a certain limit on it. For microstrip traces or for a trace on the surface layer. This is gonna be something around six uh, inches per nanosecond. What does the rise time need to be? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use the USB 2.0 high speed uh, rise time as our limiting, uh, our limiting value. And I'm gonna just use that because we're gonna look at that a little bit more closely in another video. But I'm gonna use the limiting value of 500 picoseconds or 0.5 nanoseconds. If I multiply this rise time by my propagation velocity, I get a length. So this times this gives me three inches, okay? So what that means is that 
my signal with a rising edge of 500 picoseconds is going to travel three inches during this rise time. This is where you start to see the different recommendations for how long the trace should be. It's going to be some fraction of this where you should cut this off and keep uh, your length below. What should that value be? So typically what you will see is something like L over three. I, I, there's actually one manufacturer that recommends L over two. Other people will recommend L over six and L over eight, and L over five, and L over four, L over 10, no, nobody can agree. Absolutely nobody can agree. So the reason nobody can agree is because people keep deriving these limits for different interfaces that have different allowed impedance mismatches with different rise times, and you can't just copy and paste one of these recommendations over to another. L over two might be just fine for USB low speed. What about USB high speed? Is it also gonna be just fine? Well, you should test that to actually find that out. And unfortunately, this is where if you wanna be really conservative, you need to just kind of pick one of these lower values and stick below that. So just as an example, let's pick the L over six value. So meaning we wanna to, want to keep the total length of the trace less than L right here divided by six. That means my trace length, we'll call it uh, TL, should be no less or no greater than three divided by six, which is 0.5 inches. This is not actually an out of the, you know, out of the blue number. This is not a crazy small number. It's not a crazy large number. This is just typical. So 0 0.5 inches is a nice safe value. Keep your trace lengths below that and you should be just fine. So what we'll do in one of the next videos is we will look at how to actually apply this to USB at multiple different rise times or multiple different speeds and multiple generations. And then we'll actually see what some of the limitations are for a two layer board. Now, again, you can do this type of routing on a two layer board. The problem with the two layer board is that these traces, they're gonna be really wide. I mean, you could make them 100 mils wide if you wanted to. You could do that. Generally not practical because you're gonna to have to make them thin again once you route into one of these components because I don't know of any component that is a high-speed digital component that has a 100 mil wide pitch between its, uh, between its pins. So you're not gonna be able to hit that target. You're gonna to have to go with thinner traces and you're gonna to have to accept one of these length limitations in order to make sure that you can route your board successfully. So we'll talk about that more in the next video. Okay, so you're probably thinking, wait a second, Aren't digital interfaces usually differential? Yeah, they are. Because of the issue with trace width that I've been talking about, you can't route them individually as two single-ended pairs unless you keep them below the required trace length. You can, however, route a differential topology if you can calculate the trace width and the spacing that is needed for that particular interface. So for USB 2.0, you can do it and you can usually get to about 10 mil trace width with about five mil spacing on different laminates if you go with a coplanar differential routing method. So that means you have two pairs, or you have a pair, I'm sorry, of two traces routed differentially, and they are surrounded by ground. If you can maintain those specs throughout the length of the route, then you should be able to maintain the differential impedance, and you'll be good. You need to do that over a ground plane, but you'll be good. You'll be able to hit the differential impedance spec. You could also route as differential pairs without doing it coplanar. However, the trace length or trace widths are gonna be a bit wider, so it may be more difficult to actually route into a smaller component. So just keep that in mind. But again, you have to maintain that spacing and width throughout the length of the route. Thanks everybody for watching. Hopefully this gives you a little bit of background on one of the basic exercises you need to do before you start routing high-speed signals on a two-layer board. Now, you can take this exercise and apply it to pretty much any other interface you want. You can apply it to higher uh, to higher speed USB, so like one of the newer generations, apply it to I2C or SPI. What you'll actually find is with like I2C or SPI, you've actually got a lot longer trace limitations that you can work with and you know, just go for it. Try it out on your own and see how it works. When you wanna use the best software to route your traces around your board and design your PCB, go get Altium Designer. There's a link in the description. You can download a free trial and check it out. Thanks everybody and uh, don't forget to call your fabricator and do this little calculation before you start routing on a two-layer board.